Robert Anthony Eden, 1st Earl of Avon, the 12th of June 1897 to the 14th of January 1977, was a British Conservative politician who served three periods as Foreign Secretary and then a relatively brief term as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from 1955 to 1957. Achieving rapid promotion as a young member of Parliament, he became Foreign Secretary aged 38, before resigning in protest at Neville Chamberlain's appeasement policy towards Mussolini's Italy. He again held that position for most of the Second World War, and a third time in the early 1950s. Having been deputy to Winston Churchill for almost 15 years, he succeeded him as the leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister in April 1955, and a month later won a general election. Eden's worldwide reputation as an opponent of appeasement, a man of peace, and a skilled diplomat was overshadowed in 1956 when the United States refused to support the Anglo-French military response to the Suez Crisis, which critics across party lines regarded as an historic setback for British foreign policy, signalling the end of British predominance in the Middle East. Most historians argue that he made a series of blunders, especially not realizing the depth of American opposition to military action. Two months after ordering an end to the Suez operation, he resigned as Prime Minister on grounds of ill health and because he was widely suspected of having misled the House of Commons over the degree of collusion with France and Israel. Eden is generally ranked among the least successful British Prime Ministers of the 20th century, although two broadly sympathetic biographies in 1986 and 2003 have gone some way to shifting the balance of opinion. Biographer D. R. Thorpe described the Suez Crisis as a truly tragic end to his premiership, and one that came to assume a disproportionate importance in any assessment of his career. <laughs> <laughs> Family Eden was born at Windlestone Hall, County Durham, on 12 June 1897. He was born into a very conservative family of landed gentry. He was a younger son of Sir William Eden, 7th and 5th Baronet, a former colonel and local magistrate from an old titled family. Sir William, an eccentric and often foul tempered man, was a talented watercolorist and collector of Impressionists. Eden's mother, Sybil Frances Gray, was a member of the famous Gray family of Northumberland. See below. She had wanted to marry Francis Knollys, later an important royal adviser. Although she was a popular figure locally, she had a strained relationship with her children, and her profligacy ruined the family fortunes. Eden's elder brother Tim had to sell Windlestone in 1936. Rab Butler would later quip that Eden, a handsome but ill-tempered man, was half-mad baronet, half-beautiful woman. Eden's great-grandfather was William Ironmonger, who commanded the 2nd Regiment of Foot during the Peninsular War and fought under Wellington as he became at Vimiero. He was also descended from Governor Sir Robert Eden, 1st Baronet, of Maryland and, through the Calvert family of Maryland, he was connected to the ancient Roman Catholic aristocracy of the Arundel and Howard families. He was also descendant from the Schofolitsky de Muckadel family of Denmark, and Bie family of Norway. Eden was once amused to learn that one of his ancestors had, like Churchill's ancestor the Duke of Marlborough, been the lover of Barbara Castlemaine. There was speculation for many years that Eden's biological father was the politician and man of letters George Wyndham, but this is considered impossible as Wyndham was in South Africa at the time of Eden's conception. His mother was rumoured to have had an affair with Wyndham. Eden had an elder brother, John, who was killed in action in 1914, and a younger brother, Nicholas, who was killed when the battlecruiser HMS Indefatigable blew up and sank at the Battle of Jutland in 1916. <laughs> Early life <laughs> School Eden was educated at two independent schools. The first was Sandroid School in Cobham from 1907 to 1910, where he excelled in languages. He then started at Eton College in January 1911. There, he won a Divinity Prize and excelled at cricket, rugby and rowing, winning house colours in the last. Eden learned French and German on continental holidays, and as a child is said to have spoken French better than English. 
Although Eden was able to converse with Hitler in German in February 1934, and with the Chinese premier Cho En Lai in French at Geneva in 1954, he preferred, out of a sense of professionalism, to have interpreters to translate at formal meetings. Although Eden later claimed to have had no interest in politics until the early 1920s, his teenage letters and diaries show him to have been obsessed with the subject. He was a strong, partisan conservative, rejoicing in the defeat of Charles Masterman at a by-election in May 1913, and once astonishing his mother on a train journey by telling her the MP and the size of his majority for each constituency through which they passed. By 1914 he was a member of the Eaton Society. Pop. <laughs> First World War During the Great War, Eden's elder brother, Lieutenant John Eden, was killed in action on 17 October 1914, at the age of 26, while serving with the 12th Prince of Wales's Royal Lancers. He is buried in Larch Wood Railway Cutting Commonwealth War Graves Commission Cemetery in Belgium. His uncle Robin was later shot down and captured whilst serving with the Royal Flying Corps, volunteering for service the British Army, as did many others of his generation. Eden served with the 21st Yeoman Rifles Battalion of the King's Royal Rifle Corps (KRRC), a Kitchener's Army unit, initially recruited mainly from County Durham country labourers, who were increasingly replaced by Londoners after losses at the Somme in mid-1916. He was commissioned as a temporary second lieutenant on the 2nd of November 1915, antedated to the 29th of September 1915. His battalion transferred to the Western Front on the 4th of May 1916 as part of the 41st Division. On the 31st of May 1916, Eden's younger brother, Midshipman William Nicholas Eden, was killed in action, aged 16, on board HMS Indefatigable during the Battle of Jutland. He is commemorated on the Plymouth Naval Memorial. His brother-in-law, Lord Brooke, was wounded during the war. One summer night in 1916, near Plogsteert, Eden had to lead a small raid into an enemy trench to kill or capture enemy soldiers, so as to identify the enemy units opposite. He and his men were pinned down in no man's land under enemy fire, his sergeant seriously wounded in the leg. Eden sent one man back to British lines to fetch another man and a stretcher, then he and three others carried the wounded sergeant back with, as he later put it in his memoirs, a uh, chilly feeling down our spines." Unsure whether the Germans had not seen them in the dark or were chivalrously declining to fire. He omitted to mention that he had been awarded the Military Cross MC for the incident, something of which he had made little mention in his political career. On 18 September 1916, after the Battle of Fleurs Corslet part of the Battle of the Somme, he wrote to his mother, "'I have seen things lately that I am not likely to forget. On 3 October, he was appointed an adjutant, with the rank of temporary lieutenant for the duration of that appointment. At the age of 19, he was the youngest adjutant on the Western Front. Eden's MC was gazetted in the 1917 birthday honours list. His battalion fought at Messines Ridge in June 1917. On 1 July 1917, Eden was confirmed as a temporary lieutenant, relinquishing his appointment as adjutant three days later. His battalion fought in the first few days of Third Battle of Ypres, the 31st of July to the 4th of August. Between 20 and the 23rd of September 1917, his battalion spent a few days on coastal defence on the Franco-Belgian border. On the 19th of November, he was transferred to the General Staff as a General Staff Officer Grade 3 (GSO3) with the temporary rank of Captain. He served at 2nd Army HQ, missing out on service in Italy, as the 41st Division was in Italy. After the disastrous Italian defeat at the Battle of Caporetto, between mid November 1917 and 8 March 1918, returning to the Western Front, the main theatre of war, as a major German offensive was clearly imminent, only for Eden's former battalion to be disbanded to help alleviate the British Army's acute manpower shortage. Although David Lloyd George, then the British Prime Minister, was one of the few politicians of whom Eden reported frontline soldiers speaking highly, he wrote to his sister the 23rd of December 1917 in disgust at his wait and see twaddle in declining to extend conscription to Ireland. In March 1918, during the German Spring Offensive, he was stationed near La Fere on the Oise, opposite Adolf Hitler, as he learned at a conference in 1935. At one point, when Brigade HQ was bombed by German aircraft, his companion told him, There now, you have had your first taste of the next war. 
On 26 May 1918 he was appointed Brigade Major of the 198th Infantry Brigade, part of the 66th Division. At the age of 20, Eden was the youngest brigade major in the British Army. He considered standing for Parliament at the end of the war, but the general election was called too early for this to be possible. After the armistice with Germany, he spent the winter of 1918 19 in the Ardennes with his brigade. On 28 March 1919, he transferred to be brigade major of the 99th Infantry Brigade. Eden contemplated applying for a commission in the regular army, but they were very hard to come by, with the army contracting so rapidly. He initially shrugged off his mother's suggestion of studying at Oxford. He also rejected the thought of becoming a barrister. His preferred career alternatives at this stage were standing for Parliament for Bishop Auckland, the civil service in East Africa, or the Foreign Office. He was demobilised on 13 June 1919. He retained the rank of captain. Topic. Oxford Eden had dabbled in the study of Turkish with a family friend. After the war, he studied Oriental languages Persian and Arabic at Christ Church, Oxford, starting in October 1919. Persian was his main, and Arabic his secondary, language. He studied under Richard Pissett Dewhurst and David Samuel Margoluth. At Oxford, Eden took no part in student politics, and his main leisure interest at the time was art. Eden was in the Oxford University Dramatic Society and President of the Asiatic Society. Along with Lord David Cecil and R. E. Gathorne Hardy he founded the Uffizi Society, of which he later became president. Possibly under the influence of his father he gave a paper on Cezanne, whose work was then not yet widely appreciated. Eden was already collecting paintings. In July 1920, whilst still an undergraduate, Eden was recalled to military service as a lieutenant in the 6th Battalion of the Durham Light Infantry. In the spring of 1921, once again as a temporary captain, he commanded local defence forces at Spennymoor as serious industrial unrest seemed possible. He again relinquished his commission on 8 July. He graduated from Oxford in June 1922 with a double first. He continued to serve as an officer in the Territorial Army until May 1923. Early political career, 1922–1931 1922–1924 Captain Eden, as he was still known, was selected to contest Spennymoor, as a Conservative. At first he had hoped to win, with some Liberal support as the Conservatives were still supporting Lloyd George's coalition government, but by the time of the November 1922 general election it was clear that the surge in the Labour vote made this unlikely. His main sponsor was the Marquess of Londonderry, a local co-owner. The seat went from Liberal to Labour. Eden's father had died on 20 February 1915. As a younger son, he had inherited capital of £7,675 and in 1922 he had a private income of £706 after tax approximately £375,000 and £35,000 at 2014 prices. Eden read the writings of Lord Curzon and was hoping to emulate him by entering politics with a view to specialising in foreign affairs. Eden married Beatrice Beckett in the autumn of 1923, and after a two-day honeymoon in Essex, he was selected to fight Warwick and Leamington for a by-election in November 1923. His Labour opponent, Daisy Greville Countess of Warwick, was by coincidence his sister Elfrida's mother-in-law and also mother to his wife's stepmother, Marjorie Blanche Eve Beckett née Greville. On 16 November 1923, during the by-election campaign, Parliament was dissolved for the December 1923 general election. He was elected to Parliament at the age of 26. The first Labour government, under Ramsay MacDonald, took office in January 1924. Eden's maiden speech the 19th of February 1924 was a controversial attack on Labour's defence policy and was heckled, and thereafter he was careful to speak only after deep preparation. He later reprinted the speech in a collection called Foreign Affairs 1939 to give an impression that he had been a consistent advocate of air strength. Eden admired H. H. Asquith, then in his final year in the Commons, for his lucidity and brevity. 
On 1 April 1924 he spoke urging Anglo-Turkish friendship and ratification of the Treaty of Lausanne, which had been signed in July 1923. 1924–1929 The Conservatives returned to power at the 1924 general election. In January 1925 Eden, disappointed not to have been offered a position, went on a tour of the Middle East, meeting Amir Faisal of Iraq. Faisal reminded him of the Tsar of Russia and I suspect that his fate may be similar a similar fate did indeed befall the Iraqi royal family in 1958. He inspected the oil refinery at Abadan, which he likened to a Swansea on a small scale. He was appointed Parliamentary Private Secretary PPS to Godfrey Locker Lampson, Undersecretary at the Home Office the 17th of February 1925, serving under Home Secretary William Joynson Hicks. In July 1925 he went on a second trip to Canada, Australia and India. He wrote articles for the Yorkshire Post controlled by his father-in-law Sir Gervis Beckett under the pseudonym Backbencher. In September 1925 he represented the Yorkshire Post at the Imperial Conference at Melbourne. Eden continued to be PPS to Locker Lampson when the latter was appointed Undersecretary at the Foreign Office in December 1925. He distinguished himself with a speech on the Middle East, the 21st of December 1925, calling for the readjustment of Iraqi frontiers in favour of Turkey, but also for a continued British mandate rather than scuttle. Eden ended his speech by calling for Anglo-Turkish friendship. On 23 March 1926 he spoke urging the League of Nations to admit Germany, which would happen the following year. In July 1926 he became PPS to the Foreign Secretary Sir Austin Chamberlain, besides supplementing his parliamentary income around £300 a year at that time by writing and journalism. In 1926 he published a book about his travels, Places in the Sun, highly critical of the detrimental effect of socialism on Australia, and to which Stanley Baldwin wrote a foreword. In November 1928, with Austin Chamberlain away on a voyage to recover his health, Eden had to speak for the government in a debate on a recent Anglo-French naval agreement, replying to Ramsay MacDonald then leader of the opposition. According to Austin Chamberlain, he would have been promoted to his first ministerial job, undersecretary at the Foreign Office, if the Conservatives had won the 1929 election. 1929-1931 The 1929 general election was the only time Eden received less than 50% of the vote at Warwick. After the Conservative defeat he joined a progressive group of younger politicians consisting of Oliver Stanley, William Ormsby Gore and the future Speaker W.S. Shakes Morrison. Another member was Noel Skelton, who before his death coined the phrase property-owning democracy, which Eden was later to popularize as a Conservative Party aspiration. Eden advocated co-partnership in industry between managers and workers, whom he wanted to be given shares. In opposition between 1929 and 1931 Eden worked as a city broker for Harry Lucas, a firm eventually absorbed into S.G. Warburg & Co. 1931–1932 <laughs> Foreign Affairs Minister, 1931–1935 In August 1931 Eden held his first ministerial office as Undersecretary for Foreign Affairs in Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald's national government. Initially the office of Foreign Secretary was held by Lord Reading in the House of Lords, although Sir John Simon held the job from November 1931. Like many of his generation who had served in the First World War, Eden was strongly anti-war, and strove to work through the League of Nations to preserve European peace. The government proposed measures, superseding the post-war Versailles Treaty, that would allow Germany to rearm albeit replacing her small professional army with a short-service militia and reduce French armaments. Winston Churchill criticized the policy sharply in the House of Commons on 23 March 1933, opposing undo French disarmament as this might require Britain to take action to enforce peace under the 1925 Locarno Treaty. Eden, replying for the government, dismissed Churchill's speech as exaggerated and unconstructive, commenting that land disarmament had yet to make the same progress as naval disarmament at the Washington and London treaties, and arguing that French disarmament was needed in order to secure for Europe that period of appeasement which is needed. Eden's speech was met with approval by the House of Commons. Neville Chamberlain commented shortly afterwards, 
That young man is coming along rapidly, not only can he make a good speech but he has a good head and what advice he gives is listened to by the cabinet." Eden later wrote that in the early 1930s the word, appeasement, was still used in its correct sense from the Oxford English Dictionary of seeking to settle strife. Only later in the decade did it come to acquire a pejorative meaning of acceding to bullying demands. He was appointed Lord Privy Seal in December 1933, a position that was combined with the newly created Office of Minister for League of Nations Affairs. Whilst Lord Privy Seal, Eden was sworn of the Privy Council in the 1934 birthday honours. He entered the cabinet for the first time when Stanley Baldwin formed his third administration in June 1935. Eden later came to recognize that peace could not be maintained by appeasement of Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. He privately opposed the policy of the Foreign Secretary, Sir Samuel Hoare, of trying to appease Italy during its invasion of Abyssinia Ethiopia in 1935. When Hoare resigned after the failure of the Hoare-Laval Pact, Eden succeeded him as Foreign Secretary. When Eden had his first audience with King George V, the king is said to have remarked, no more coals to Newcastle, no more whores to Paris." At this stage in his career, Eden was considered as something of a leader of fashion. He regularly wore a Homburg hat, which became known in Britain as an Anthony Eden. <laughs> <laughs> Foreign Secretary and Resignation, 1935–1938 Eden became foreign secretary at a time when Britain was having to adjust its foreign policy to face the rise of the fascist powers. He supported the policy of non-interference in the Spanish Civil War through conferences like the Nyon Conference and supported Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain in his efforts to preserve peace through reasonable concessions to Germany. The Italian-Ethiopian War was brewing, and Eden tried in vain to persuade Mussolini to submit the dispute to the League of Nations. The Italian dictator scoffed at Eden publicly as the best dressed fool in Europe. Eden did not protest when Britain and France failed to oppose Hitler's reoccupation of the Rhineland in 1936. When the French requested a meeting with a view to some kind of military action in response to Hitler's occupation, Eden in a statement firmly ruled out any military assistance to France. Growing dissatisfaction with Chamberlain's policy of coming to friendly terms with Italy led to his resignation in public protest. Eden used secret intelligence reports to conclude Italy was an enemy. Eden at this point had no complaints about the appeasement of Nazi Germany. He became a conservative dissenter, leading a group that conservative whip David Margeson called the Glamour Boys. Meanwhile, the leading anti appeaser Winston Churchill led a similar group, called the Old Guard. They were not yet allies and did not see eye to eye until Churchill became Prime Minister in 1940. There was much speculation that Eden would become a rallying point for all the disparate opponents of Neville Chamberlain, but his position declined heavily amongst politicians as he maintained a low profile, avoiding confrontation, though he opposed the Munich Agreement and abstained in the vote on it in the House of Commons. However, he remained popular in the country at large, and in later years was often wrongly supposed to have resigned as Foreign Secretary in protest at the Munich Agreement and appeasement generally. In a 1967 interview, Eden explained his decision to resign, we had an agreement with Mussolini about the Mediterranean and Spain, which he was violating by sending troops to Spain, and Chamberlain wanted to have another agreement. I thought Mussolini should honor the first one before we negotiated for the second. I was trying to fight a delaying action for Britain, and I could not go along with Chamberlain's policy. Second World War During the last months of peace in 1939, Eden joined the Territorial Army with the rank of Major, in the London Rangers Motorised Battalion of the King's Royal Rifle Corps and was at annual camp with them in Beaulieu, Hampshire, when he heard news of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, on the outbreak of war the 3rd of September 1939 Eden, unlike most Territorials, did not mobilise for active service. Instead, he returned to Chamberlain's government as Secretary of State for Dominion Affairs, but was not in the War Cabinet. As a result, he was not a candidate for the premiership when Chamberlain resigned in May 1940 after the Narvik debate and Churchill became Prime Minister. Churchill appointed Eden Secretary of State for War. 
At the end of 1940 Eden returned to the Foreign Office, and in this role became a member of the Executive Committee of the Political Warfare Executive in 1941. Although he was one of Churchill's closest confidants, his role in wartime was restricted because Churchill conducted the most important negotiations, with Franklin D. Roosevelt and Joseph Stalin, himself, but Eden served loyally as Churchill's lieutenant. In December 1941, he traveled by ship to Russia where he met the Soviet leader Joseph Stalin and surveyed the battlefields upon which the Russians had successfully defended Moscow from the German army attack in Operation Barbarossa. Nevertheless, he was in charge of handling most of the relations between Britain and Free French leader de Gaulle during the last years of the war. Eden was often critical of the emphasis Churchill put on the special relationship with the United States and was often disappointed by American treatment of their British allies. In 1942, Eden was given the additional role of leader of the House of Commons. He was considered for various other major jobs during and after the war, including Commander in Chief Middle East in 1942. This would have been a very unusual appointment as Eden was a civilian. General Harold Alexander was in fact appointed, Viceroy of India in 1943. General Archibald Wavell was appointed to this job, or Secretary General of the newly formed United Nations Organization in 1945. In 1943 with the revelation of the Katyn massacre Eden refused to help the Polish government in exile. In early 1943 Eden blocked a request from the Bulgarian authorities to aid with deporting part of the Jewish population from newly acquired Bulgarian territories to British-controlled Palestine. After his refusal, some of those people were transported to concentration camps in Nazi-occupied Poland. In 1944 Eden went to Moscow to negotiate with the Soviet Union at the Tolstoy Conference. Eden also opposed the Morgenthau plan to deindustrialize Germany. After the Stalag Luft three murders, he vowed in the House of Commons to bring the perpetrators of the crime to exemplary justice, leading to a successful manhunt after the war by the Royal Air Force Special Investigation Branch. Eden's eldest son, pilot officer Simon Gascoigne Eden, went missing in action and was later declared dead, while serving as a navigator with the RAF in Burma, in June 1945. There was a close bond between Eden and Simon, and Simon's death was a great personal shock to his father. Mrs. Eden reportedly reacted to her son's loss differently, and this led to a breakdown in the marriage. De Gaulle wrote him a personal letter of condolence in French. In 1945 he was mentioned by Halvdan Cote among seven candidates who were qualified for the Nobel Prize in Peace. However, he did not explicitly nominate any of them. The person actually nominated was Cordell Hull. Topic: Post-war, 1945 to 1955. Topic: In opposition, 1945 to 1951. After the Labour Party won the 1945 election, Eden went into opposition as deputy leader of the Conservative Party. Many felt that Churchill should have retired and allowed Eden to become party leader, but Churchill refused to consider this. As early as the spring of 1946, Eden openly asked Churchill to retire in his favor. He was in any case depressed during this period by the breakup of his first marriage and the death of his eldest son. Churchill was in many ways only part-time leader of the opposition. Given his many journeys abroad and his literary work, and left the day-to-day -day work largely to Eden. Eden was largely regarded as lacking sense of party politics and contact with the common man. In these opposition years, however, he developed some knowledge about domestic affairs and created the idea of a property-owning democracy, which Margaret Thatcher's government attempted to achieve decades later. His domestic agenda is overall considered center-left. Return to government, 1951–1955 In 1951 the Conservatives returned to office and Eden became Foreign Secretary for a third time, though not Deputy Prime Minister. Churchill gave him this title in the first list of ministers submitted to the King, but the King forbade it on the grounds that this office is unknown to the Constitution. Churchill was largely a figurehead in this government, and Eden had effective control of British foreign policy for the second time, as the empire declined and the Cold War grew more intense. 
Eden's biographer Richard Lamb said that Eden bullied Churchill into going back on commitments to European unity made in opposition. The truth appears to be more complex. Britain was still a world power, or at least trying to be, in 1945-55, with the concept of sovereignty not as discredited as on the continent. The United States encouraged moves towards European federalism as it wanted to withdraw U.S. troops and get the Germans rearmed under supervision. Eden was less Atlanticist than Churchill and had little time for European federalism. He wanted firm alliances with France and other Western European powers to contain Germany. Half of British trade at that time was with the Stirling area, and only a quarter with Western Europe. Despite later talk of lost opportunities, even Macmillan, who had been an active member of the European movement after the war, acknowledged in February 1952 that Britain's relationship with the United States and the Commonwealth would prevent her from joining a federal Europe at that time. Eden was also irritated by Churchill's hankering for a summit meeting with the USSR, during the period in 1953 after Stalin's death and whilst Eden was seriously ill from a botched bile duct operation. Despite the ending of the British Raj in India, British interest in the Middle East remained strong. Britain had treaty relations with Jordan and Iraq and was the protecting power for Kuwait and the Trucial states, the colonial power in Aden, and the occupying power in the Suez Canal. Many right-wing conservative MPs, organized in the so-called Suez Group, sought to retain this imperial role, though economic pressures made maintenance of it increasingly difficult. Britain did seek to maintain its huge military base in the Suez Canal zone and, in the face of Egyptian resentment, further develop its alliance with Iraq, and the hope was that the Americans would assist Britain, possibly through finance. While the Americans did cooperate with the British in overthrowing the Mossadegh government in Iran, after it had nationalized British oil interests, the Americans developed their own relations in the region, taking a positive view of the Egyptian free officers and developing friendly relations with Saudi Arabia. Britain was eventually forced to withdraw from the Canal Zone and the Baghdad Pact Security Treaty was not supported by the United States, leaving Eden vulnerable to the charge of having failed to maintain British prestige. Eden had grave misgivings about American foreign policy under Secretary of State John Foster Dulles and President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Eisenhower was concerned, as early as March 1953, at the escalating costs of defense and the increase of state power which this would bring. Eden was irked by Dulles's policy of brinkmanship or display of muscle in relations with the communist world. The success of the 1954 Geneva Conference on Indochina ranks as the outstanding achievement of his third term in the Foreign Office, although he was critical of the United States' decision not to sign the accord. During the summer and fall of 1954, the Anglo Egyptian agreement to withdraw all British forces from Egypt was also negotiated and ratified. There were concerns that if the EDC was not ratified as they wanted, the Republican administration in the United States might withdraw into defending only the Western Hemisphere although recent documentary evidence confirms that the U.S. intended to withdraw troops from Europe anyway if the EDC was ratified. After the French Assembly rejected the EDC in September 1954, Eden tried to come up with a viable alternative. Between 11 and 17 September he visited every major West European capital, to negotiate West Germany becoming a sovereign state and entering the Brussels Pact prior to entering NATO. Paul-Henri Spock said he "...saved the Atlantic Alliance." In 1954 he was appointed to the Order of the Garter and became Sir Anthony Eden. Prime Minister, 1955–1957 In April 1955 Churchill finally retired, and Eden succeeded him as Prime Minister. He was a very popular figure as a result of his long wartime service and his famous good looks and charm. His famous words, "'Peace comes first, always' added to his already substantial popularity. On taking office, he immediately called a general election for 26 May 1955, at which he increased the conservative majority from 17 to 60, an increase in majority that broke a 90-year record for any UK government. The 1955 general election was the last in which the Conservatives won the majority share of the votes in Scotland. However, Eden had never held a domestic portfolio and had little experience in economic matters. 
He left these areas to his lieutenants such as Rab Butler, and concentrated largely on foreign policy, forming a close relationship with U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower. Eden's attempts to maintain overall control of the Foreign Office drew widespread criticism. Eden has the distinction of being the British Prime Minister to oversee the lowest unemployment figures of the post-World War II era, with unemployment standing at just over 215,000—barely 1% of the workforce—in July 1955. Suez 1956. The alliance with the U.S. proved not universal, however, when in July 1956 Gamal Abdel Nasser, president of Egypt, nationalized seized the Suez Canal, following the withdrawal of Anglo-American funding for the Aswan Dam. Eden believed the nationalization was in violation of the Anglo-Egyptian Treaty of 1954 that Nasser had signed with the British and French governments on 19 October 1954. This view was shared by Labour leader Hugh Gateskill and Liberal leader Joe Grimmond. In 1956 the Suez Canal was of vital importance since over two-thirds of the oil supplies of Western Europe 60 million tons annually passed through it, with 15,000 ships a year, one-third of them British, three-quarters of all canal shipping belonged to NATO countries. Britain's total oil reserve at the time of the nationalisation was enough for only six weeks. The Soviet Union was certain to veto any sanctions against Nasser at the United Nations. Britain and a conference of other nations met in London following the nationalisation in an attempt to resolve the crisis through diplomatic means. However, the 18 nations' proposals, including an offer of Egyptian representation on the board of the Suez Canal Company and a share of profits, were rejected by Nasser. Eden feared that Nasser intended to form an Arab alliance that would threaten to cut off oil supplies to Europe and, in conjunction with France, decided he should be removed from power. Eden, drawing on his experience in the 1930s, saw Nasser as another Mussolini, considering the two men aggressive nationalist socialists determined to invade other countries. Others believed that Nasser was acting from legitimate patriotic concerns and the nationalization was determined by the Foreign Office to be deliberately provocative but not illegal. The Attorney General, Sir Reginald Manningham Buller, was not asked for his opinion officially but made his view that the government's contemplated armed strike against Egypt would be unlawful known through the Lord Chancellor. Anthony Nutting recalled that Eden told him, What's all this nonsense about isolating Nasser or neutralizing him as you call it? I want him destroyed, can't you understand? I want him murdered, and if you and the Foreign Office don't agree, then you'd better come to the Cabinet and explain why. When Nutting pointed out that they had no alternative government to replace Nasser, Eden apparently replied, I don't give a damn if there's anarchy and chaos in Egypt. At a private meeting at Downing Street on 16 October 1956 Eden showed several ministers a plan, submitted two days earlier by the French. Israel would invade Egypt, Britain and France would give an ultimatum telling both sides to stop and, when one refused, send in forces to enforce the ultimatum, separate the two sides, and occupy the canal and get rid of Nasser. When Nutting suggested the Americans should be consulted Eden replied, I will not bring the Americans into this. Dulles has done enough damage as it is. This has nothing to do with the Americans. We and the French must decide what to do and we alone. Eden openly admitted his view of the crisis was shaped by his experiences in the two world wars, writing, We are all marked to some extent by the stamp of our generation, mine is that of the assassination in Sarajevo and all that flowed from it. It is impossible to read the record now and not feel that we had a responsibility for always being a lap behind. Always a lap behind, a fatal lap. There was no question of an immediate military response to the crisis. Cyprus had no deep water harbors, which meant that Malta, several days sailing from Egypt, would have to be the main concentration point for an invasion fleet if the Libyan government would not permit a land invasion from its territory. Eden initially considered using British forces in the Kingdom of Libya to regain the canal, but then decided this risked inflaming Arab opinion. Unlike the French Prime Minister Guy Mollet, who saw regaining the canal as the primary objective, Eden believed the real need was to remove Nasser from office. He hoped that if the Egyptian army was swiftly and humiliatingly defeated by the Anglo-French forces the Egyptian people would rise up against Nasser. 
Eden told Field Marshal Sir Bernard Montgomery that the overall aim of the mission was simply to knock Nasser off his perch. In the absence of a popular uprising, Eden and Mollet would say that Egyptian forces were incapable of defending their country and therefore Anglo French forces would have to return to guard the Suez Canal. Eden believed that if Nasser were seen to get away with seizing the canal, then Egypt and other Arab countries might move closer to the Soviet Union. At that time, the Middle East accounted for 80 to 90 percent of Western Europe's oil supply. If Nasser were seen to get away with it, then other Middle East countries might be encouraged to nationalize their oil. The invasion, he contended at the time, and again in a 1967 interview, was aimed at maintaining the sanctity of international agreements and at preventing future unilateral denunciation of treaties. Eden was energetic during the crisis in using the media, including the BBC, to incite public opinion to support his views of the need to overthrow Nasser. In September 1956 a plan was drawn up to reduce the flow of water in the Nile by using dams in an attempt to damage Nasser's position. However, the plan was abandoned because it would take months to implement, and due to fears that it could affect other countries such as Uganda and Kenya, on 25 September 1956, the Chancellor of the Exchequer Harold Macmillan met informally with President Eisenhower at the White House. He misread Eisenhower's determination to avoid war and told Eden that the Americans would not in any way oppose the attempt to topple Nasser. Though Eden had known Eisenhower for years and had many direct contacts during the crisis, he also misread the situation. The Americans saw themselves as the champion of decolonization and refused to support any move that could be seen as imperialism or colonialism. Eisenhower felt the crisis had to be handled peacefully. He told Eden that American public opinion would not support a military solution. Eden and other leading British officials incorrectly believed Nasser's support for Palestinian terrorists against Israel, as well as his attempts to destabilize pro-Western regimes in Iraq and other Arab states, would deter the U.S. from intervening with the operation. Eisenhower specifically warned that the Americans, and the world, would be outraged, unless all peaceful routes had been exhausted, and even then, the eventual price might become far too heavy. At the root of the problem was the fact that Eden felt that Britain was still an independent world power. His lack of sympathy for British integration into Europe, manifested in his skepticism about the fledgling European Economic Community EEC, was another aspect of his belief in Britain's independent role in world affairs. Israel invaded the Sinai Peninsula at the end of October 1956. Britain and France moved in ostensibly to separate the two sides and bring peace, but in fact to regain control of the canal and overthrow Nasser. The United States immediately and strongly opposed the invasion. The United Nations denounced the invasion, the Soviets were bellicose, and only New Zealand, Australia, West Germany and South Africa spoke out for Britain's position. The Suez Canal was of lesser economic importance to the USA, which acquired 15% of its oil through that route. Eisenhower wanted to broker international peace in fragile regions. He did not see Nasser as a serious threat to the West, but he was concerned that the Soviets, who were well known to want a permanent warm water base for their Black Sea fleet in the Mediterranean, might side with Egypt. Eisenhower feared a pro-Soviet backlash amongst the Arab nations if, as seemed likely, Egypt suffered an humiliating defeat at the hands of the British, French and Israelis. Eden, who faced domestic pressure from his party to take action, as well as stopping the decline of British influence in the Middle East, had ignored Britain's financial dependence on the U.S. in the wake of the Second World War, and had assumed the U.S. would automatically endorse whatever action taken by its closest ally. At the Law Not War rally in Trafalgar Square on 4 November 1956, Eden was ridiculed by Anurin Bevan. Sir Anthony Eden has been pretending that he is now invading Egypt to strengthen the United Nations. Every burglar of course could say the same thing, he could argue that he was entering the house to train the police. So, if Sir Anthony Eden is sincere in what he is saying, and he may be, then he is too stupid to be a prime minister. Public opinion was mixed, some historians think that the majority of public opinion in the UK was on Eden's side. Eden was forced to bow to American diplomatic and financial pressure, and protests at home, by calling a ceasefire when Anglo-French forces had captured only 23 miles of the canal. With the US threatening to withdraw financial support from Stirling, the cabinet divided and the Chancellor of the Exchequer Harold Macmillan threatening to resign unless an immediate ceasefire was called, Eden was under immense pressure. 
He considered defying the calls until the commander on the ground told him it could take up to six days for the Anglo-French troops to secure the entire canal zone. Therefore, a ceasefire was called at quarter past midnight on 7 November. In his 1987 book Spycatcher Peter Wright said that, following the imposed ending to the military operation, Eden reactivated the assassination option for a second time. By this time virtually all MI6 agents in Egypt had been rounded up by Nasser, and a new operation, using renegade Egyptian officers, was drawn up. It failed principally because the cache of weapons which had been hidden on the outskirts of Cairo was found to be defective. Suez damaged Eden's reputation for statesmanship, in many eyes, and led to a breakdown in his health. He went on vacation to Jamaica in November 1956, at a time when he was still determined to soldier on as Prime Minister. His health, however, did not improve, and during his absence from London, his Chancellor Harold Macmillan and Rab Butler worked to manoeuvre him out of office. On the morning of the ceasefire Eisenhower agreed to meet with Eden to publicly resolve their differences, but this offer was later withdrawn after Secretary of State Dulles advised that it could inflame the Middle Eastern situation further. The Observer newspaper accused Eden of lying to Parliament over the Suez Crisis, while MPs from all parties criticised his calling a ceasefire before the canal was taken. Churchill, while publicly supportive of Eden's actions, privately criticized his successor for not seeing the military operation through to its conclusion. Eden easily survived a vote of confidence in the House of Commons on 8 November. <laughs> 1957 resignation While Eden was on holiday in Jamaica, other members of the government discussed on 20 November how to counter charges that the UK and France had worked in collusion with Israel to seize the canal, but decided there was very little evidence in the public domain. On his return from Jamaica on 14 December, Eden still hoped to continue as Prime Minister. He had lost his traditional base of support on the Tory left and amongst moderate opinion nationally, but appears to have hoped to rebuild a new base of support amongst the Tory right. However, his political position had eroded during his absence. He wished to make a statement attacking Nasser as a puppet of the Soviets, attacking the United Nations and speaking of the lessons of the 1930s, but was prevented from doing so by Macmillan, Butler and Lord Salisbury. On his return to the House of Commons the 17th of December, he slipped into the chamber largely unacknowledged by his own party. One Conservative MP rose to wave his order paper, only to have to sit down in embarrassment whilst Labour MPs laughed. On 18 December he addressed the 1922 committee Conservative backbenchers, declaring, As long as I live, I shall never apologise for what we did, but was unable to answer a question about the validity of the Tripartite Declaration of 1950 which he had in fact reaffirmed in April 1955, two days before becoming Prime Minister. In his final statement to the House of Commons as Prime Minister the 20th of December 1956, he performed well in a difficult debate, but told MPs that, "...there was not foreknowledge that Israel would attack Egypt." Victor Rothwell writes that the knowledge of his having misled the House of Commons in this way must have hung over him thereafter, as was the concern that the U.S. administration might demand that Britain pay reparations to Egypt. Papers released in January 1987 showed the entire cabinet had been informed of the plan on the 23rd of October 1956. Eden suffered another fever at Checkers over Christmas, but was still talking of going on an official trip to the USSR in April 1957, wanting a full inquiry into the Crab affair and badgering Lord Hailsham, first Lord of the Admiralty, about the 6 million pounds being spent on oil storage at Malta. Eden resigned on the 9th of January 1957 after his doctors warned him his life was at stake if he continued in office. John Charmley writes, "...ill health provide d a dignified reason for an action i.e. resignation which would, in any event, have been necessary." Rothwell writes that, "...mystery persists." Over exactly how Eden was persuaded to resign, although the limited evidence suggests that Butler, who was expected to succeed him as Prime Minister, was at the center of the intrigue. Rothwell writes that Eden's fevers were nasty but brief and not life-threatening, and that there may have been manipulation of medical evidence to make Eden's health seem even worse than it was. Macmillan wrote in his diary that nature had provided a real health reason when a diplomatic illness might otherwise have had to be invented. 
David Carlton 1981 even suggested that the palace might have been involved, a suggestion discussed by Rothwell. As early as spring 1954 Eden had been indifferent to cultivating good relations with the new queen. Eden is known to have favored a Japanese or Scandinavian-style monarchy i.e. with no involvement in politics whatsoever and in January 1956 he had insisted that Nikita Khrushchev and Nikolai Bulganin spend only the minimum amount of time in talks with the Queen. Evidence also exists that the palace were concerned at not being kept fully informed during the Suez Crisis. In the 1960s Clarissa Eden was observed to speak of the Queen in an extremely hostile and belittling way. And in an interview in 1976 Eden commented that he would not claim she was pro-Suez. Although the media expected Butler would get the nod as Eden's successor, a survey of the cabinet taken for the Queen showed Macmillan was the nearly unanimous choice, and he became Prime Minister on 10 January 1957. Shortly afterwards Eden and his wife left England for a holiday in New Zealand. Suez in retrospect A. J. P. Taylor wrote in the 1970s, Eden, destroyed his reputation as a peacemaker and led Great Britain to one of the greatest humiliations in her history, he seemed to take on a new personality. He acted impatiently and on impulse. Previously flexible he now relied on dogma, denouncing Nasser as a second Hitler. Though he claimed to be upholding international law, he in fact disregarded the United Nations organization which he had helped to create. The outcome was pathetic rather than tragic. Biographer Dr. Thorpe says Eden's four goals were to secure the canal, to make sure it remained open and that oil shipments would continue, to depose Nasser, and to prevent the USSR from gaining influence. The immediate consequence of the crisis was that the Suez Canal was blocked, oil supplies were interrupted, Nasser's position as the leader of Arab nationalism was strengthened, and the way was left open for Russian intrusion into the Middle East. Michael Foote pushed for a special inquiry along the lines of the parliamentary inquiry into the attack on the Dardanelles in the First World War, although Harold Wilson, Labour Prime Minister 1964 70 and 1974 76, regarded the matter as a can of worms best left unopened. This talk ceased after the defeat of the Arab armies by Israel in the Six-Day War of 1967, after which Eden received a lot of fanmail telling him that he had been right, and his reputation, not least in Israel and the United States, soared. In 1986 Eden's official biographer Robert Rhodes James re-evaluated sympathetically Eden's stance over Suez and in 1990, following the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, James asked, Who can now claim that Eden was wrong? Such arguments turn mostly on whether, as a matter of policy, the Suez operation was fundamentally flawed or whether, as such, revisionists thought, the lack of American support conveyed the impression that the West was divided and weak. Anthony Nutting, who resigned as a foreign office minister over Suez, expressed the former view in 1967, the year of the Arab-Israeli Six-Day War, when he wrote that, We had sown the wind of bitterness and we were to reap the whirlwind of revenge and rebellion. Conversely, Jonathan Pearson argues in Sir Anthony Eden and the Suez Crisis, Reluctant Gamble 2002, that Eden was more reluctant and less bellicose than most historians have judged. D. R. Thorpe, another of Eden's biographers, writes that Suez was a truly tragic end to his premiership, and one that came to assume a disproportionate importance in any assessment of his careers. He suggests that had the Suez venture succeeded, there would almost certainly have been no Middle East War in 1967, and probably no Yom Kippur War in 1973 also. Guy Millard, one of Eden's private secretaries, who 30 years later, in a radio interview, spoke publicly for the first time on the crisis, made an insider's judgment about Eden. It was his mistake of course and a tragic and disastrous mistake for him. I think he overestimated the importance of Nasser, Egypt, the Canal, even of the Middle East itself. Quote, While British actions in 1956 are routinely described as imperialistic, the motivation was in fact economic. Eden was a liberal supporter of nationalist ambitions, such as over Sudanese independence. 
His 1954 Suez Canal Base Agreement withdrawing British troops from Suez in return for certain guarantees was sold to the Conservative Party against Churchill's wishes. Rothwell believes that Eden should have cancelled the Suez invasion plans in mid-October, when the Anglo-French negotiations at the United Nations were making some headway, and that in 1956 the Arab countries threw away a chance to make peace with Israel on her existing borders. Britain–France rejected plan for union British government cabinet papers from September 1956, during Eden's term as Prime Minister, have shown that French Prime Minister Guy Mollet approached the British government suggesting the idea of an economic and political union between France and Great Britain. This was a similar offer, in reverse, to that made by Churchill drawing on a plan devised by Leo Amory in June 1940. The offer by Guy Mollet was referred to by Sir John Colville, Churchill's former private secretary, in his collected diaries, The Fringes of Power 1985, his having gleaned the information in 1957 from Air Chief Marshal Sir William Dixon during an air flight and, according to Colville, after several whiskies and soda. Mollet's request for union with Britain was rejected by Eden, but the additional possibility of France joining the Commonwealth of Nations was considered, although similarly rejected. Colville noted, in respect of Suez, that Eden and his foreign secretary Selwyn Lloyd, "...felt still more beholden to the French on account of this offer." Retirement <inaudible> 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 Eden resigned from the House of Commons in March 1957. He retained much of his personal popularity in Britain and soon regretted his retirement, and contemplated standing again. Several Conservative MPs were reportedly willing to give up their seats for him, although the party hierarchy were less keen. He finally gave up such hopes in late 1960 after an exhausting speaking tour of Yorkshire. Macmillan initially offered to recommend him for a viscountcy, which even assumed to be a calculated insult, and he was granted an earldom which was then the traditional rank for a former prime minister after reminding Macmillan that he had already been offered one by the Queen herself. He entered the House of Lords as the Earl of Avon in 1961. In retirement Eden lived in Rose Bower by the banks of the River Ebble in Broad Chalk, Wiltshire. Starting in 1961 he bred a herd of 60 Herefordshire cattle one of whom was called Churchill, until a further decline in his health forced him to sell them in 1975. In July 1962, Eden made front page news by commenting that, Mr. Selwyn Lloyd has been horribly treated, when the latter was dismissed as Chancellor in the reshuffle known as the Night of the Long Knives. In August 1962, at a dinner party, he had a slanging match with Nigel Birch, who as Secretary of State for Air had not wholeheartedly supported the Suez invasion. In 1963 Eden initially favored Hailsham for the Conservative leadership but then supported Home as a compromise candidate. From 1945 to 1973, Eden was Chancellor of the University of Birmingham. In a television interview in 1966 he called on the United States to halt its bombing of North Vietnam to concentrate on developing a peace plan. That might conceivably be acceptable to Hanoi. The bombing of North Vietnam, he argued, would never settle the conflict in South Vietnam. On the contrary, he declared, "...bombing creates a sort of David and Goliath complex in any country that has to suffer—as we had to, and as I suspect the Germans had to, in the last war." Eden sat for extensive interviews for the famed multi-part Thames television production, The World at War, which was first broadcast in 1973. He also featured frequently in Marcel Ophel's 1969 documentary Le Chagrin et la Pitié, discussing the occupation of France in a wider geopolitical context. He spoke impeccable, if accented, French. Eden's occasional articles and his early 1970s television appearance were an exception to an almost total retirement. He seldom appeared in public, unlike other former prime ministers, e.g., James Callaghan, who commented frequently on current affairs. He was even accidentally omitted from a list of conservative prime ministers by Margaret Thatcher when she became conservative leader in 1975, although she later went out of her way to establish relations with Eden and, later, his widow. 
In retirement he was highly critical of regimes such as Sukarno's Indonesia which confiscated assets belonging to their former colonial rulers, and appears to have reverted somewhat to the right-wing views which he had espoused in the 1920s. Memoirs <inaudible> 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 In retirement Eden corresponded with Selwyn Lloyd, coordinating the release of information and with which writers they would agree to speak and when. Rumours that Britain had colluded with France and Israel appeared, albeit in garbled form, as early as 1957. By the 1970s they had agreed that Lloyd would only tell his version of the story after Eden's death in the event, Lloyd would outlive Eden by a year, struggling with terminal illness to complete his own memoirs. In retirement Eden was particularly bitter that Eisenhower had initially indicated British and French troops should be allowed to remain around Portshead, only for the U.S. Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. to press for an immediate withdrawal at the UN, thereby rendering the operation a complete failure. Eden felt the Eisenhower administration's unexpected opposition was hypocritical in light of the 1953 Iranian coup d'état and the 1954 Guatemalan coup d'état. Eden published three volumes of political memoirs, in which he denied that there had been any collusion with France and Israel. Like Churchill, Eden relied heavily on the ghost writing of young researchers, whose drafts he would sometimes toss angrily into the flowerbeds outside his study. One of them was the young David Dilks, in his view, American Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, whom he particularly disliked, was responsible for the ill fate of the Suez adventure. In an October press conference, barely three weeks before the fighting began, Dulles had coupled the Suez Canal issue with colonialism, and his statement infuriated Eden and much of the UK as well. The dispute over Nasser's seizure of the canal, wrote Eden had, of course, nothing to do with colonialism, but was concerned with international rights." He added that, "...if the United States had to defend her treaty rights in the Panama Canal, she would not regard such action as colonialism." His lack of candor further diminished his standing and a principal concern in his later years was trying to rebuild his reputation that was severely damaged by Suez, sometimes taking legal action to protect his viewpoint. Eden faulted the United States for forcing him to withdraw, but he took credit for United Nations action in patrolling the Israeli Egyptian borders. Eden said of the invasion, Peace at any price has never averted war. We must not repeat the mistakes of the pre-war years, by behaving as though the enemies of peace and order are armed with only good intentions." Recalling the incident in a 1967 interview, he declared, "...I am still unrepentant about Suez. People never look at what would have happened if we had done nothing. There is a parallel with the 1930s. If you allow people to break agreements with impunity, the appetite grows to feed on such things." I don't see what other we ought to have done. One cannot dodge. It is hard to act rather than dodge." In his 1967 interview which he stipulated would not be used until after his death, Eden acknowledged secret dealings with the French and «intimations» of the Israeli attack. He insisted, however, that the joint enterprise and the preparations for it were justified in the light of the wrongs it the Anglo-French invasion was designed to prevent. I have no apologies to offer," Eden declared, at the time of his retirement, Eden had been short of money, although he was paid a £100,000 advance for his memoirs by the Times, with any profit over this amount to be split between himself and the newspaper. By 1970, they had brought him £185,000 around £3 million at 2014 prices, leaving him a wealthy man for the first time in his life. Towards the end of his life, he published a personal memoir of his early life, Another World, 1976. Topic: <laughs> Personal life. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Relationships. On 5 November 1923, shortly before his election to Parliament, he married Beatrice Beckett, who was then 18. They had three sons, Simon Gascoigne (1924–1945), Robert, who died 15 minutes after being born in October 1928, and Nicholas (1930–1985). The marriage was not a success, with both parties apparently conducting affairs. By the mid-1930s, his diaries seldom mention Beatrice. 
The marriage finally broke up under the strain of the loss of their son Simon, who was killed in action with the RAF in Burma in 1945. His plane was reported, missing in action. On 23 June and found on 16 July, Eden did not want the news to be public until after the election result on 26 July, to avoid claims of making political capital from it. Between 1946 and 1950, whilst separated from his wife, Eden conducted an open affair with Dorothy, Countess Beatty, the wife of David, Earl Beatty. Eden was the great-great-grandnephew of author Emily Eden and in 1947, wrote an introduction to her novel The Semi-Attached Couple 1860. In 1950, Eden and Beatrice were finally divorced, and in 1952, he married Churchill's niece Clarissa Spencer Churchill, a nominal Roman Catholic who was fiercely criticized by Catholic writer Evelyn Waugh for marrying a divorced man. Eden's second marriage was much more successful than his first had been. Topic. Problems with health Eden had an ulcer, exacerbated by overwork, as early as the 1920s. His life was changed by a medical mishap, during an operation on 12 April 1953, to remove gallstones, his bile duct was damaged, leaving Eden susceptible to recurrent infections, biliary obstruction, and liver failure. The physician consulted at the time was the royal physician, Sir Horace Evans, 1st Baron Evans. Three surgeons were recommended and Eden chose the one that had previously performed his appendectomy, John Basil Hume, surgeon from St. Bartholomew's Hospital. Eden suffered from cholangitis, an abdominal infection which became so agonizing that he was admitted to hospital in 1956 with a temperature reaching 106 degrees Fahrenheit 41 degrees Celsius. He required major surgery on three or four occasions to alleviate the problem. He was also prescribed benzodrine, the wonder drug of the 1950s. Regarded then as a harmless stimulant, it belongs to the family of drugs called amphetamines, and at that time they were prescribed and used in a very casual way. Among the side effects of benzodrine are insomnia, restlessness, and mood swings, all of which Eden suffered during the Suez Crisis. Indeed, earlier in his premiership he complained of being kept awake at night by the sound of motor scooters. Eden's drug use is now commonly agreed to have been a part of the reason for his bad judgment while Prime Minister. The Thorpe biography, however, denied Eden's abuse of benzodrine, stating that the allegations were untrue, as is made clear by Eden's medical records at Birmingham University, not yet at the time available for research." The resignation document written by Eden for release to the Cabinet on 9 January 1957 admitted his dependence on stimulants but not that they affected his judgment during the Suez Crisis in the autumn of 1956. I have been obliged to increase the drugs taken after the bad abdominal operations considerably and also increase the stimulants necessary to counteract the drugs. This has finally had an adverse effect on my precarious inside," he wrote. However, in his book The Suez Affair 1966, historian Hugh Thomas, quoted by David Owen, ch. pc. frcp, claimed that Eden had revealed to a colleague that he was "...practically living on benzodrine," at the time. Final illness and death In December 1976, Eden felt well enough to travel with his wife to the United States to spend Christmas and New Year with Averill and Pamela Harriman, but after reaching the States his health rapidly deteriorated. Prime Minister James Callahan arranged for an RAF plane that was already in America to divert to Miami to fly Eden home. Eden died from liver cancer in Salisbury on the 14th of January 1977, aged 79. He was survived by Clarissa. He was buried in St Mary's Churchyard at Alvedaston, just three miles upstream from Rose Bower, at the source of the River Ebel. Eden's papers are housed at the University of Birmingham Special Collections. At his death, Eden was the last surviving member of Churchill's War Cabinet. Eden's surviving son, Nicholas Eden, 2nd Earl of Avon (1930–1985), known as Viscount Eden from 1961 to 1977, was also a politician and a minister in the Thatcher government until his premature death from AIDS at the age of 54. Topic. Styles of address 
1897–1916, Mr. Anthony Eden 1916–1923, Mr. Anthony Eden 1923–1934, Mr. Anthony Eden 1934–1954, The Right Honorable Anthony Eden 1954–1957, The Right Honorable Sir Anthony Eden 1957–1961, The Right Honorable Sir Anthony Eden 1961–1977, The Right Honorable The Earl of Avon Character, speaking style and assessments Eden, who was well-mannered, well-groomed, and good-looking, always made a particularly cultured appearance. This gave him huge popular support throughout his political life, but some contemporaries felt he was merely a superficial person lacking any deeper convictions. That view was enforced by his very pragmatic approach to politics. Sir Oswald Mosley, for example, said he never understood why Eden was so strongly pushed by the Tory party, as he felt that Eden's abilities were very much inferior to those of Harold Macmillan and Oliver Stanley. In 1947, Dick Crossman called Eden that peculiarly British type, the idealist without conviction. U.S. Secretary of State Dean Acheson regarded Eden as a quite old-fashioned amateur in politics typical of the British establishment. In contrast, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev commented that until his Suez adventure Eden had been in the top world class. Eden was heavily influenced by Stanley Baldwin when he first entered Parliament. After earlier combative beginnings, he cultivated a low-key speaking style which relied heavily on rational argument and consensus building rather than rhetoric and party point scoring, and which was often highly effective in the House of Commons. However, he was not always an effective public speaker, and his parliamentary performances sometimes disappointed many of his followers, e.g., after Eden's resignation from Chamberlain's government. Churchill once even commented on one of Eden's speeches that the latter had used every cliché except God is love. This was deliberate. Eden often struck out original phrases from speech drafts and replaced them with clichés. Eden's inability to express himself clearly is often attributed to shyness and lack of self-confidence. Eden is known to have been much more direct in meeting with his secretaries and advisers than in cabinet meetings and public speeches, and sometimes tended to become enraged and behave like a child, only to regain his temper within a few minutes. Many who worked for him remarked that he was two men, one charming, erudite, and hard-working, the other petty and prone to temper tantrums during which he would insult his subordinates. As Prime Minister, Eden was notorious for telephoning ministers and newspaper editors from 6 a.m. onwards. Rothwell writes that even before Suez, the telephone had become a drug, and that during the Suez crisis Eden's telephone mania exceeded all bounds. Eden was notoriously unclubbable and offended Churchill by declining to join the other club. He also declined honorary membership in the Athenaeum. However, he maintained friendly relations with opposition MPs. For example, George Thomas received a kind two-page letter from Eden on learning that his stepfather had died. Eden was a trustee of the National Gallery in succession to Macdonald between 1935 and 1949. He also had a deep knowledge of Persian poetry and of Shakespeare and would bond with anybody who could display similar knowledge. Rothwell writes that although Eden was capable of acting with ruthlessness, for instance, over the repatriation of the Cossacks in 1945, his main concern was to avoid being seen as an appeaser, or over the Soviet reluctance to accept a democratic Poland in October 1944. Like many people, Eden persuaded himself that his past actions were more consistent than they had in fact been. Recent biographies put more emphasis on Eden's achievements in foreign policy and perceive him to have held deep convictions regarding world peace and security as well as a strong social conscience. Rhodes James applies to Eden Churchill's famous verdict on Lord Curzon in Great Contemporaries. The morning had been golden, the noontime was bronze, and the evening lead. But all was solid, and each was polished until it shone after its fashion. Topic: Cultural depictions. Topic: Ancestry. Topic. Memoirs 
Another World. London. Doubleday, 1976. Covers early life. The Eden Memoirs, Facing the Dictators. London. Cassell, 1962. Covers early career and first period as Foreign Secretary, to 1938. The Eden Memoirs, The Reckoning. London. Cassell, 1965. Covers 1938-1945. The Eden Memoirs, Full Circle. London. Cassell, 1960. Covers post-war career. <laughs>